you can understand there. I think Jackie, you, you could how they may create a, a, yeah, another person yeah. to defend their vulnerable self and and put their vulnerable self in hiding or a compartment and let the other person, you know, function or take yeah. charge or because it's a protective process, it, isn't definitely it? Definitely, it is. Yeah. And particularly if there's amnesia involved in it, it's like I don't need to deal with this because Betty sorted that out and I don't need to go there. It, yeah, it, it, it's like I said, it amazes me what the mind can do. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show. Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 72 of the therapy show Behind Closed Doors with myself, Jackie Jones, and the delightful Mr. Bob Cook. <laughs> <laughs> I, need to me. I feel delightful today, so that's fine. Good, good. I'll take ownership of that term. That was a good one to pick then. And what we're going to be talking about in this episode is working with multiple personality disorder. Yes, yes, yes. So back in the day, I started training to be a psychotherapist in 1985. I did a counselling course, one of the first counselling courses, uh, sorry, certificate in counselling courses in 1984. Started training to be a psychotherapist in 1995 at Metanoa Psychotherapy Training Institute in London. Um, did a whole training in transaction analysis. Then in 90, I think it was one, 92, I started to get interested in integrative psychotherapy. And so around that time, I started to get interested in what was called multiple personality disorder. It sort of became a specialized subject for me. But I was very, very interested. And I started, and in fact, I had two multiples. Well, I work in those days were called multiple, multiples, if you like, people who were so fragmented, they had different different selves put it that yeah. way if we look at where we are now i don't know 32 years later or whatever it is i i was thinking about this before i came on air when did the term multiple personality disorder start to be discarded and the new term of dissociated dissociative identity disorder start because that's what we call the old term multiple personality disorder now dissociative identity disorder i don't actually know <clears throat> maybe it was about 10 years ago <clears throat> so when people talk, talk about dissociative identity disorder as a sort of continuum and in my book the frag the really fragmented uh, more psychotic um end of it is multiple personality disorder and then on the other end of it and more on the neurotic side of life we all to an extent have fragmented parts of ourselves or dissociated parts of ourselves um, that we have utilized in terms of coping mechanisms. But we talk about the really fragmented, fragmented, more psychotic um, end of the spectrum. That's what I would call multiple personality disorder. So when I'm talking about this in the podcast, I'm talking about the real end of the health continuum where, you know, the individual is so fragmented and so defended that they have developed different selves yeah that's really what was called multiple personality disorder would we generally see those in the therapy room no no that's what i was thinking <laughs> <clears throat> because there's they usually that 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 order that you're talking about they usually have had um or do have um a live psychiatric history yeah and they're usually on high medication or they are dealt with uh, in the community if it, uh, you know yeah in a way where um they'd have psychiatrists they'd have um different resources and not only would you not see them in psychotherapy room particularly i don't know well it could be argued by many people that psychotherapy isn't particularly helpful mm. for that end of the spectrum of dissociative identity disorder. So the answer is 
no. And back in 1992, when I was working with people who were highly fragmented, um, I did with work, I think, with people who were not necessarily right at, well, they were pretty towards the end of it, because you could argue that when somebody presents with such a fragmented sense of self, which is a different, no, sorry, which is di a different self, yeah. being defended to cope, from, cope with uh, from the trauma, that they, 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 they the psychosis going on. So, you know, I, I, I did work with people, I think, um, who were, were, were the way they defended against the deep trauma was to create another self. Yeah. And clearly that way of coping against the trauma, um, what comes with it is amnesia, losing time, um, forgetfulness of memory, high denial, um, fragmentation, disavowalment of the self, where they're so unintegrated that they create, the, create these entities or these selves. Um, and if you work at that level, you'll probably find quite a lot of, quite a number of selves. Yeah. I've watched films on it, but I've, I've yeah. never... I, I don't really know anything else about it other than... Well, perhaps the most famous book written back in there uh, was a book called Sybil. Yeah, that's what the one that I was thinking, yeah. There's been some films uh, or documentaries. Um, there's been some very dramatic film, I think, about 2015. Um, I can't remember what it was called, but it, it was... It was about it was a more dramatic film about um you know the self or was it called split i think right or split yeah. <clears throat> i didn't particularly talk there were some very good documentaries richard erskine did a very good documentary on working with multiples and if won the is it the belgian mental health award in 2012 or something so which i've actually still got may not be might be earlier than 2012 so th th there are the there are some resources around. I think I learned a lot on you know training with Richard and also dealing or treating people at that level of dissociation, denial, fragmentation, unintegrated, split off parts of the self, and how how it was a way of coping with extreme trauma. Yeah. And I know in, in other podcasts, we've spoke about, you know, integrating the self and, you know, that works well in psychotherapy. Do, would, that, would that work with somebody with disassociative identity disorder? Yeah, well, the theme working working is, of course, integration. Yeah. That's the end goal. Yeah. Does it, can it work? <clears throat> That's not what we're talking about. Full integration. Probably not. Probably the working goal would be, um, for me, it would be that they know their different fragmented parts of self so that they know that Joan exists or Polly exists or Frida exists and they can talk to the different parts. Of, they can talk to the different selves yeah. uh, in a cooperative way so they can function. That's so interesting. Probably that would be a working thing is if you start, how can I explain this? But if they, if you start working with a goal, which is that the, say, so say somebody has got, I don't know, let's have 10 different selves. Yeah. And each self is protecting different developmental levels of trauma. Yeah. And it's been a way the person has coped so they could function as best they can today. Yeah. Um, so certain cells might be, might appear to help the person function uh, in difficult situations, for example. If you start um, or have as a goal that they have to say goodbye to that part of this, that, you know, that, that self, say goodbye to Polly or say goodbye to Frederick or say goodbye to Alexander, 
they would find the grief too overwhelming. It's really interesting, <laughs> really, because... They probably you know, end up being hosp hospitalized. Yeah. Multiple levels of grief. Because it, my well, understanding, and like I said, it has only been from, through watching films and things, is that they are real people with their yeah, own that's, personality, that's look at it. different voices and different actions and hold themselves differently. Yeah. It's, it's not yeah. like I like a lie-in in the morning, but I also <laughs> like getting up early. We're yeah, not there'd be no people. I. That's right. Yeah. There be yeah. an I. Yeah. And the way to look at it is developmentally. So in other words, the other, in this case, has been created uh, to protect from the diff the traumas and the, the traumas at different developmental levels. Yeah. So you and they and these people in multiple languages will be called alters. A L T E R S. Um, so Fred might be an alter, alter, Jean might be an alter, Joan might be an alter, but they were created at a certain amount, you know, a certain time in their history to protect the person from trauma. Yeah. So, for example, if somebody's being, you know, repeatedly, repeatedly sexually abused, they might create a warrior. Yeah. 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 Warrior would take the abuse instead of the real self, for example. Um, so it's a coping mechanism. Yeah. So. If you're working with a multiple, you would one of the really good things to do is a psychological map. So you, you might start off with, I don't know, three selves, say, you know, Fred, Frederick, Alexander, and Jane. And then you do a map where, you know, we'd look at Jane might have another name called the um, servant, or, you know, Frederick might be called the warrior. and X might be called something else. And they would all be created to protect the self from trauma. Yeah. That's what they were created for. At different times. Oh, at different developmental of times. Of the person's life, yeah, yeah. The different traumas they went through. Yeah. And usually you may, it wouldn't be uncommon at all to find younger alters. So we had, say, Jane, Frederick, and Alexander as the, te you know, older alters. You might find teenage alters, or you might find alters which were created at the age of seven or eight to deal with the younger trauma. Yeah. And so you need to, I used to always find it important to do a map because I couldn't keep it all in my head. Yeah, understandably. I might find out there's 10 alters. And are they all connected? Yes, but no, no in terms of amnesia. In other words, uh, it's usually a host, what we call a host alter, which can talk to some of the alters, but, well, say there's nine, nine, nine alters, can talk to perhaps nine alters, and, and they become the chief mediator for time. But even, even then, you might find other alters that the host alter didn't know about as yeah. you do the therapy. Yeah. With Sybil, I, was, I think it was 64 alters, but it was a high number anyway. It was a lot, yeah. Yeah. Um, and like you say, all different ages and different sexes. You know, a female doesn't necessarily yeah. have all yeah. female alters. There's males well. in there as well, yeah. Yeah, and many of the alters don't know about the other existence of the other alters. Yeah. And as you do the therapy, they, start, they may start to meet. But the dialogue... Nearly always went through the host altar. So if you say Jane was the host altar, they would need to talk to Jack and Fred, and then they would introduce Jack to Fred, and there'd be that would be the level of communication. Yeah. And all, all the time, you are in fact one of the clinical goals is that there would be a level of integration where they start to know about each other and they can start to learn to mediate and talk to each other. So clinically they would have dialogue, which would mean there would be um, 
hopefully uh, ha more healthy, healthy internal dialogue. So the more they can talk to each other and know that the different parts are there, yeah. the more they can have it in a dialogue, you have, you're starting to move more towards not only the person knowing the host, knowing the existence of these altars, but can help them talk to each other and therefore uh, starting to understand what was probably so ununderstandable to them. It's so interesting what the mind can do to protect us. <laughs> oh. When you think about it, it's oh. it's amazing. And like you said, you know, amnesia comes with it. So when the one person and mm. then they turn into another one, they don't remember anything about the last person that they were. Yeah, and another really big characteristic working with multiples is that they lose time. Yeah. So they they don't know where they'll wake up, perhaps going, I'll wake up somewhere. I'm using wake up in the clinic because they'll find themselves, say, on a train going to Scotland, but they don't know how they got, how they there, got there. Yeah. Example. Or they find themselves in bed with John, but then they don't know how they've gone, got to that situation. Yeah. They're, they're people usually are of a highly traumatized, a really traumatic history. They're usually people who are highly promiscuous. Usually people who have high amnesia, people who are fragmented, often can be quite psychotic um, and high levels of dissociation and depersonalization. But if you help them un help them un understandable, in other words, they, if they can start making meaning of the different cells and they can talk to each other and create internal dialogue, they can get some understanding about functioning in a different way than they did before, for example, yeah. which can be more healthy. That's what I'm saying. I think the treatment of multiples at this level is more about that they can function more healthily as a, as a team, if you like, yeah, rather than separate entities who didn't even know about each other. But we generally wouldn't see this in the therapy room. Not really. I mean, there's not, not many somebody with 10 that, different personalities anyway. Not, there's not really many trainings and training, psychotherapy trainings that even cover this. No. Nowadays. Yeah. Really, they cover dissociative identity disorder and they would train it, train therapists uh, in terms of health continuum, looking at traits of dissociation, traits of. Uh, but, but then you, but would they? teach them right up to the top where you're looking at you know real fragmentation fragmentation and multiple it's like we're talking about here well they might mention it but i don't know how much they talk about the treatment of yeah of working with type, type of clientele probably because they will not really possibly be working with that type of person and like you, you started off this podcast, it's about being highly trained in that area. It's not like oh, any one of us can just jump into doing, I would imagine it's quite overwhelming and there is a team that yeah. works with the person. That's what I mean. I, I, I bought, there's not that much written. I bought a, bought a very book, good book in 1993. So it's an old book by, by somebody called Cluft, K-L-U-F-T called multiple personality disorder, which gave me a, a sort of treatment plan for working in the ways that I'm talking about here. Yeah. The other thing that's a useful read because it explains, you know, traits of dissociation, tra it explains how a person, you know, can be so fragmented that they actually create many different selves to cope. Um trauma and how you can treat them yeah K -L -K -L -U -F -T, multiple personality disorder it's one of the best books on that i wrote but then this is an old book 1992 i'm sure there's been others written uh since then on this subject but that was one of my favorite books an interesting read i would imagine yeah it is and on another dimension at all um, when we're talking about trauma, 
people defend against trauma in many, many different ways. If there's multiple traumas, multiple, I'd say rapes, multiple um, levels of assault, you can understand there, I think, Jackie, you, you could, how they may create a, a, yeah, another person yeah. to defend their vulnerable self and, and put their vulnerable self in hiding or a compartment and let the other person, you know, function or take yeah. charge or because it's a protective process. It isn't definitely, it? it is, yeah. And particularly if there's amnesia involved in it, it's like I don't need to deal with this because Betty sorted that out and I don't need to go there. It, yeah, it, it, it's like I said, it amazes me what the mind can do. Oh, the mind is the mind is such a wonderful wonderful uh instrument especially in terms of protectiveness of yeah. the vulnerables of the self yeah i think of all the work i did with those types of people one of the best things i did or learned to do was help different parts of the self become a team um because then they could function in more healthy ways. Yeah. It wasn't that I, I never went down the road, and I don't think many people did, by the way, which is to say goodbye to these different parts of the self because it's too overwhelming. Yeah. And that's a really nice way of putting it because it's not about integrating them. It's about knowing that they're all there <laughs> and working as a team. Oh, yeah. Um, that's the way I went. Yeah. It sounds like fascinating work, Bob. Yeah, and it was because you are dealing with people who've been so violated, yeah. so invaded, so traumatized. It's it, it's it's hard work in the sense that you go the extra mile. Yeah, it's raining. It's um, you're listening to the most hideous histories. Yeah. You need a lot of supervision and a lot of therapy yourself. Um, very rewarding. But when I look back at my professional career, I would say I worked with two or three people, and the two particular people I can think of in this, what I'm talking about here. And um, it's real courage to work at this level. For not, I'm not just talking about the therapist, I'm talking about actually the, the, the person. The yeah. Client. Yeah. It takes a lot, lot of courage. You there? Yeah, yeah. Well, something's flushed up on the Takes a lot of courage, a tremendous lot of courage. And and um, I was very fortunate to have the training I had, and um, it was an amazing part of my life working with that type of population. And I know you were saying then you know, looking at the client rather than you as a therapist, but for you as a therapist, it must have been, it must have impacted on you tremendously yeah. working with people yeah. like that. Like you say, hearing yeah. the trauma and how it, you know, how it affected them and the fact that, you know, for protection, they had multiple personalities and everything. That's, that's heavy going stuff for the therapist. Yeah. And with both, with the people I'm thinking about, they were in groups, psychotherapy groups. And, th and that for lots of different reasons. Um, because they needed many levels of protection. Uh, and you couldn't do the work that I did in an hour. Yeah. <laughs> so, understandably. You know, plus, and also, there's a lot of things you would have to put in place to work in the ways I'm talking about. Yeah. But I, it enriched my career and um, I think much to say more accepted it was exhausting. I, I, well, one thing I would say, you need to have a high level of training to work at this level. Yeah. And again, I, 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 I was fortunate to have that and to watch, I also watched, I'm thinking of Richard who trained me, Richard Erskine tra trained, uh, I mean, many different ways. Uh, watching him work with these different this, this different population, yeah. And I've still got that video. I think it was from 
I don't think I don't know when it was. I think it was in the early two thousands, which won that award. Um, it's called Denial. I think I've got it somewhere. It's um, on an old VHS tape, so it must have been years ago, actually. Um, uh, I haven't watched it for ages, but it's highly skilled work. Amazing. Today, I, you know, uh, I, I saw it helped me for further work as well because I knew what dissociation was. I knew what fragmentation was. I knew uh, the sort of coping mechanisms and how to work with them. And you're working with regression all the time. That means going back to the younger parts of the self. So I learned a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Because each one of those independently can be worked on, but it's when it's all together that it's it becomes yeah. a different entity. Yeah. yeah. And I had spent 36 years as a group psychotherapist. Yeah. Being, running two or three groups every week. And that's where you, that's the venue that you could work regressively and work in the way I'm talking about. Yeah. In terms of time. Yeah, yeah. Because groups do run completely differently to, to working with an yeah, individual. That's right. yeah. Well, yeah. And I also used to do five day, seven day psychotherapy intensives where we could do this deep type of aggressive work. Yeah. And so the therapy intensive was started nine o'clock in the morning and end up six o'clock at night for seven days. Wow, yeah. And that's the venue where I could do this type of work. And then, that, and then of course, that come back to the, the groups every week where we could work on integration, protection and support. I don't know if nowadays, I don't hear that, hear of this type of work because I think largely because um, there's been a movement away from group psychotherapy. I've never worked in groups. I've never run groups, oh, no. couples and in individuals, but not groups. Yeah. It's a really important venue for aggressives working with regression where you've got more time to be able to work that way. Yeah. Say 50 minutes, which is a small amount of time. And in some ways you might argue less protective. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you do, even if, you know, I, I've, I've been in a group for my own therapy, but not run a group. But even if you're just an observer in the group, you get so much from being there when somebody else is talking. A lot of vicarious healing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think, you know, as I learned how to be a group psychotherapist and became proficient in that i then started to learn how to run three-day psychotherapy intensives and five-day psychotherapy intensives because i'd learned how to do it as you know i started off you know three hours, three hours in a group yeah yeah and of course i've been in these venues myself yeah 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 so i had the model of how to do it I've been trained how to do it. And you don't hear much in the United Kingdom. Group psychotherapy seems to have disappeared to a large extent, which I think is a great loss and sadness to psychotherapy field. Yeah, because there is a need for it. I, I thoroughly enjoyed being in a group. Mm. I, I, think I, was, I think I was avoiding therapy. I think it was easier for me to avoid therapy in a group, <laughs> which mm. again is, is part of the thing as the you know the the therapist you've got to be aware of what everybody's doing within that group mm. and, and i run groups with eight people there yeah so we'll have contact yeah. With XX. if we move that up to over to treatment of multiple personality disorders the way i've been talking about it it's like running group therapy yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's easy because you'd have the different contracts with different alters yeah it's it's mind-boggling yeah and the more I talk about now to you and talk i talk about oh gosh i've worked in so many different ways that um it was very enriching uh part of my career yeah um and the people listening to this um 
group psychotherapy, I think, enriched the psychotherapy field. And I wish it was more in vogue. Yeah. Maybe sure. we can resurrect it, Bob. Maybe we can bring it back again. Yeah, I'm sure that I know there is group psychotherapy around. Um, don't get me wrong, with somebody in our institute is group, group psychotherapy, but it's not as popular yeah. as it was 10, 20. I mean, when uh, in the mid 90s, it was very popular. Yeah. Now it's, and I'm not sure why. Individual therapy seems to be much more in the vogue than group psychotherapy was. And I think there's a real place for both. Yeah. Mm. So we'll leave it there, Bob, until next time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me to talk about this subject because um, I go away feeling, um, I suppose I go away feeling enriched to, because I'm thinking of the memories and the things that we did in the client therapy arena and um, quite a humbling experience. Yeah. It's because it is... It, 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 be prepared to work with great trauma if you're going to work with this population. Yeah. I love listening to you talking about your stories because it's so valuable. Yes, we can talk about the theory behind it, but when you're, you know, talking about the situations that you've been in and how you worked with them and, and what happened and everything else, it's invaluable. Mm. For me as a therapist, it is. Oh, thank you. And, uh, I know off air we start. We just said, "Oh, what should we talk about next?" So I'm going to send you two titles, and uh, people listening will just have to, you know, come along to the next podcast next week and join the excitement of listening to what we definitely come up with. Yes, it's a cliffhanger. We're finishing on a cliffhanger. Oh, what a best way to <laughs> the best way I can think of. Definitely. Until next time, Bob. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye you've been listening to the therapy show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review we'll be back next week with another episode